Uh, well, no, you, you, you said at the beginning that I'd set you quite a task, but I think, you, you know, remarkably, you, you have been up to the task and even exceeded it. Um, I have a, a lot of things that I would like to ask Professor Frampton, but um, can I ask this, uh, just to take this one, take this one away from us, please. Can you take those? They're, they're in, our, in our eyes. In the back. Can you hear me in the booze? This one. Oh, it's hot. Yeah, fine. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Well? laughs> um, Kenneth, I'm going to uh, ask you, uh, I'm just going to return to, that, to, the, um, to the book at the moment and then we'll perhaps, we'll, we'll get some courageous questions from the floor. Uh, the book you, you produced in uh, 83 with Hal Foster, mm. could you give a little bit of a background to that? Because it, it had what, what now seems an incredible range of speakers. You had Rosalind Krauss, you had Craig Owens, you had Gregory Almer, you had Frederick Jameson, Jean Baudrillard, um, I'm sure I'm missing Douglas Crimp, yeah. yourself, you had Edward Said. Yeah. Yes. How, how did that come about, was my first question. And have you, did you meet some of these subsequently? Did you ever have anything to do with some of these? Yes. Well, for a brief while, uh, one of them crashed with a girlfriend, but I mean, that didn't last too long. Uh, um, uh, yes, I, I knew Said in Colombia. I, of course, I know Hal Foster. Um, yes, and Douglas Crimp, who I've seen recently. And um, who else was there? there? Well, Frederick Jameson, of course, I did meet in the Netherlands for the first time. And uh, I'm, I'm a big admirer of that. Uh, this, well, his treatment of critical realism in this book, The Seeds of Time, is is very sensitive, and, uh, but of course very critical at the same time. Okay, uh, just a little bit higher. Higher? Okay. Higher? All right, okay. keep it higher. All right. Uh, okay. Do I have to say it again? No, I think. <laughs> no. Uh, okay. Yes. Did you meet Edward Said? Yes, but I, I sat in on classes that Said gave on uh, uh, Gramsci. Yeah. That's Mainly that was the contact, and I sometimes, uh, you know, very much in passing socially. But, um, yeah. I mean, I didn't know any of these people that well. I knew, well, best of all, of course, I knew Rosalind Krauss and Hal Foster, basically. I mean, that's the October connection. So I said that on the editorial board. Um, I mean, of course, it is to Hal, it's credit for all these people. Yes. Um, well, I want to take you to um, 1956 to 1965 before you left um, for New York in 65. Um, there was a there was a considerable amount of British um, architects, uh, critics that were around at the time. Um, I would like you to give a little flavour. Many of them also came to the states. At yeah. some time, yeah. can you can you explain that exodus and how that happened? Um, also around the time of the of your short editorship of, of AD, and then with Monica Pigeon, and how that what what was the circle like, um, and who were the architects involved in that and those? I mean, there is this mythical. I mean, not mythical for me, but I mean, there, I, sometimes it, it, it's an extraordinary person, Thomas Stevens. Sam Stevens, who had a kind of, uh, not, no, not really, a sort of slight, sort of, uh, he, had a, had, he was living alone and had a sort of soiree in Marlborough High Street and had been a teacher in Liverpool and had, in fact, been a teacher at Colin Row. Um, and uh, Sam, it's Sam who gets me on to Hannah Arms, the human condition. And, uh, and, and he, I think, had a, he had a big influence on a lot of people. Alan Cahoon and, and yes, or, or Jim's 
telling the truth and uh, so on. And a uh, very funny person who, who you know, would, uh, yes, he had, a, you know, he was a polymath of sorts because he knew all about rock organs but also about small or plumbing systems and, 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 uh, and many other things as well. I got an art history degree from the Cornwall and, and had studied art nature before. I, I, and taught on it, which was a little bit way. But in any case, uh, I have this funny story that uh, once in Jim study, I was once in Jim Stanley's house in London, and Sam shows up with a bunch of students. And uh, before, and Jim opens the door, and before he can say anything, Jim says, Sam says, Dear Jim, I brought a pair of pliers with me, and I noticed the thin two radios in the living room are best. I come straight in, and, and that was kind of the ticket to get into the house with all these students. Uh, so there was a kind of intimacy, I mean, there was a lot of intimacy, I think. I mean, that, in the sense that the scene was kind of somehow intimate and, uh, and was sort of spontaneous, you know, and, uh, and also a bit divided because it was a circle that was sort of gathered around the Smithsons, I suppose, and another circle that was gathered around Sterling a bit more. Um, but uh, then there were the people who crossed between these poles. But it, I mean, uh, I think it's something that was, um, I don't know, it's the, I mean, in that moment, I mean, the, the big cities weren't so big, you know, and the whole thing was much more intimate. Well, was that the time when there were the restaurants in Gould Street and in, in um, yeah. Soho, and there were different different groups. Well, there was a famous pub, you know, in, in called the York Minster, which was known as the French pub, you know, which also had, uh, well, I think there were painters and uh, more radical figures on one side of, of the, on one bar, and the architects on another, you know, who were terrified by the ambassadors. Well, anyway. And, uh, but that pub was a very important place. Yeah. Um, when did you actually start writing? Yes. I, I, I wrote for a newspaper called Art News, and the first thing I ever wrote, yes, but the first essay I ever wrote, a piece of criticism, was on Marcel Janko, when he came from an exhibition that Marcel Janko had in Israel. And I was living in Israel, and I sent this, um, I don't know how I managed to make that contact, but anyway, I sent this essay back, and it was published in Art News. And then I recall that Maybe I'll take one or two other essays, but the essay, but anyway, I, I, when um, Hockney graduated from the Royal College of Art, um, um, I wrote an essay on, on uh, Ron Kitai's The Murder of Rosa, Rosa Luxemburg. I mean, Kitai was a very American uh, painter who studied in the Royal College of Art and lived in London for many years. But uh, you know, was very interested in Abbey Warburg I mean, he, he, and in Russian literature and so on. And, and well, in Middle Europe you know, politically fascinated him. And uh, his, his graduate painting was a murder of Rosa Luxemburg, which I liked and I remember that. Uh, I remember that uh, you worked in Douglas Stevens' oh, yes. office um, and. How did it come about that you did the f one of the first books um, with photography? Uh, the, was it the buildings of England? I can't remember yes, exactly. It was. The, yes. The buildings. British, of British building. British building. Yeah. And um, your colleague, uh, a mutual friend of ours, Michael Carapita, yes. did the photographs. Yes. Um, how did that interest in working with Michael Carapitian, working with the photographer, very specific black and white photographs, if, if, you, if you have a chance to go online and look at them, there's, there's some uh, splendid shots of uh, the, Economist, the Economist building by Smithson and by uh, Sterling's um, Le uh, Leicester, wasn't it? Yes. Leicester. Um, how did you uh, move on from that and what was the interest to go to Maison de Verre? How did Maison de Verre? Yeah. Well, there, actually there was a, a... 
Yes, I remember her name, but I never met her. There was a woman whose name was Margaret Talent, I think. And she, um, I think, worked in Paris for Transitus Jurassic Awards. And she made, she's the first person to make uh, measured plans of the three floors of the Maison de Bay, which were published in, uh, in Architects and Building News. And uh, then, you know, the, the, for some reason, I don't know why, really, the British knew about the Maison de Bay. The French, they completely ignored it. They didn't even know it existed. But uh, people like uh, Jim Sterling and, and Collins and Jim Wilson went to Paris to see the Maison de Verre, and uh, so the, it was sort of in the air, you know, that there was this remarkable house. And, and then, the, well, this question of Michael Carapetti, and Michael Carapetti worked in the office of Dr. Stephen. Somehow I didn't know how Douglas got this commission to do the book, so the book was done with Douglas and with Carapetti. It's a kind of mafia book, you know, with friends, in a way, most of the Yes, most of the buildings were people we knew. And actually, Bannon wrote a review of that book remarking on the fact that it was a kind of gang. You know. And uh, yes. so, um, but the Maison de Verne, my sort of deeper involvement with the Maison de Verne came about because uh, when we were talking about Tilly Hill, once in the novel, we were talking about the novelology, but in any case, uh, 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 you know, Peter Anderson was responsible for inviting me to the States and, um, and he did a deal, I mean, then he was very, well, he's still very persuasive. But somehow, uh, he and Michael Graves were able to persuade the Princeton University to offer me uh, a semester of teaching and then a semester of scholarship. And, and there is a famous, uh, apparently, university fellowship, fellowship called Hodder Fellowship. Which somehow they talk to the university is giving me. I didn't apply for it, I just got given it. And then I didn't know what to do with it exactly, because I, you know, I, I sort of painted, I, I was not yet finished painting myself into this corner of misspending my entire life teaching in the school of art. And uh, uh, so I was, you know, not prepared to do anything that could be thought to, you know, seriously academic. And I didn't know what to do. Uh, and finally, I decided after some time to go and measure the laser there, and it was like a kind of idea. Because there were these plans, but there was always another thing. You know, the new drawings existed. When the house was first published in 32, I think, in the French magazine, there were not too many plans, there were no plans. And then if there were any plans, he said plans that we used immediately to construct on the site, you know, directly. And, uh, so we discussed the reason why we mentioned this, and then, well, then we produced this issue of Perspective 12. Uh, uh, and, and you were doing exactly what in this picture? Yes, well, uh, I, was, I was kind of trying to get under the staircase. You know, the stairs came down as a hinged joint. There was a use of hinged joints, but at the top of the stair was the bottom, and I was trying to measure the joint, which I suppose I faked in the end. <laughs> okay, um, Kenneth had, had quite a long day coming from Toronto. Uh, whilst I perhaps um, just close this up a little bit, if anybody w really would like to come and ask a question, there are two microphones. Uh, this, this is your chance. We have about 10 or 15 more minutes if, if Kenneth is, is willing. So t the, there's a... So, uh, so, excuse me? It would be disappointing without. Yes. Uh, thank you. What do, what do you feel are the means that we could facilitate this kind of architecture that you would like to see expressed uh, more? as compared to the barren modern types that we're experiencing now. Well, I think a lot of the architecture now is just very uh, barren and uh, bleak. It's just kind of, uh, uh, to me anyway, it's uh, just kind of like um, rectangles and things like this. Yeah. And I think you want, you want a much different expression. How do you feel we could um, right. Right. Yes, okay. encourage this. Yeah. 
I, I think, you know, I, I really believe that landscape architecture is incredibly important. And that really, uh, I mean, uh, I, I have been tempted to say it privately, but now I can also say it publicly, but I think that uh, 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 architecture has more to learn from landscape architecture than the other way around. And uh, so I think this question of the site and of the, uh, of the grounding of the building in the site is, is a fundamental uh, issue. And, uh, um, and the root is just the building. And, and, and to try to um, make a big effort that the building should not just be handled as a freestanding aesthetic object. I mean, that's the problem with a lot of the spectacular architecture. I mean, both of the work of Pesos de Moro and uh, Rem, and most of the work of Gary, and, uh, and Zahar, of course, all these stars, you know, the spectacular star I mean, all of it is, is placed on the ground, you know, like it's a freestanding aesthetic object, like it's a big art you know. I think that this is all very negative. And, and um, you know, it's used for branding, it's used as a signal signal operation. It, it's a, I think in the end it's a very, uh, yeah, it's very, Yes, it's, 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 I think it's a very successful. In some ways, it's a very perverted creativity. And, uh, but of course, it is very much part of the society of spectacle. So, the, the kind of things I try to talk about this evening, and uh, I have anyway, sort of what it's become obsessed with, I suppose, you know, is to do with this sort of smaller operation. Well, I want to say something else, which is related to this. You know, well, I, I'm very happy about the fact that uh, on my, when I was 80, that there was this event at uh, uh, Columbia, which I was able to, yes, I, I, I support our work, curated it. And, and uh, I invited three um, American objects and two Canadian objects to speak at this event. And I deliberately uh, wanted to have Canadian objects. Because I knew, and I still think, I don't think it made any difference, by the way, but I, I still, these are being my colleagues, I mean, who I think, I think, you know, uh, uh, maybe I'm not doing them justice, but I think they have a, you know, Canada, where is Canada exactly? You know, maybe Canada doesn't really exist for people, you know, not where it's at, you know? And, and so there's a big amount of this in Canada, but, they don't, uh, they're not too interested in this. Really. And these other guys, apart from this one occasion, uh, I, you know, uh, they, they were invited to speak at Columbia. I knew they were exactly the kind of people who had never been invited to speak at Columbia, which also includes Rick Joy, uh, you know, from the West Coast, and, and Stanley Silas from San Francisco. And, uh, and Stephen, you know, some one of the work, of course, he does, from time to time, speak at Columbia. But, and, uh, and, and that is a problem of some of the other ones, which is that I think if you, uh, if you can uh, look underneath the radar, so to speak, you know, look underneath the spectacular, you can find a little bit of people doing very interesting, delicate work, you know, in Dublin and in Mumbai and in uh, Oslo and, and Yes, all of them, you know. Uh, Iceland and uh, Australia, uh, you know, made in culture of uh, Australia and Australia. Uh, and and the, I mean, that's where, that's what I think, where you can find much, much more interesting work, you know. And, and uh, so I mean, your Australian objects are probably people have never heard of, you know. Well, they ought to, you want to have heard of, but Sean Bell for example, or Kerry Hill, who are very well deserved to be in America, but you know, they were really good, really very good objects in Australia. And of course, with clients, because of, well, I can't really produce work with that kind of quality with our clients. And oh, this reminds me of an incredible thing. When I first was asked 
by Alice Byrne to go to Philadelphia to meet Gary Burke. And, and I think it's when Glenn had asked her to ask me anyway. It wasn't a big deal. A small seminar went out, and then Glenn talks about the way he works in Australia. First of all, like myself, he doesn't type, but he's not logical. Second, he, he therefore no secretary in the office. All letters written in block capital, you know, architects printing it. For that, the class. And, and, uh, and all of that, right? And then he says the most amazing thing. And he, uh, oh, yes. Right? He, he, two kind of rhetorical things. First of all, he says, if a woman, I don't know why it has to sound like that, but anyway, if a woman comes up asking to design a house for her and her husband, I say, actually, both of you, so that you have to talk to each other, you need to come in all the time study. And secondly, he said, you know, I have a class who are willing to wait two and a half years for a house, for me, to design a house for them. And I thought when he said that, that I, I, I was in disbelief, you know. And uh, I thought, you know, well, we think of Australia as somewhere, you know, it's not a very fine place still. But they are middle class people willing to wait two and a half years for a house. No American middle class would ever wait two and a half years for a house. So this question of the class, of course, is, is a big, is also an issue, you know. The one has to have a class. And I think perhaps the failure of universities is they're not very good at, at creating clients in a way, you know. That, uh, yeah. Which reminds me of something else, this is getting to the other hand. <laughs> but Leonardo Pinedo, the also rare books now, but produced five books, you know, the paperbacks, which were designed so I believe, published by Leonardo for use in Italian high schools to train, you know, ordinary kids about what is environmental design. But I think even in Italy, that didn't work, I think. I don't think they ever know why. I mean, I haven't had a set, but I, maybe what I'm saying is, I mean, maybe, I think it's correct, I think it's correct, that's what they were intended for. But when you think about it, we don't in school in education, basically education, give students anything about environmental design. And I think it's no accident. I think power doesn't want ordinary people to think about these things, basically. Because that would only be bothering them. Yeah. I, I think this is a big, big failure you know, that we can't, we obviously can't do good work without good class. There's a question there, please. In a world dominated by the image, how does an architect now create an architecture not only for the eyes, but also for the body? Do you have any clues on this for us? Yeah, I know, I know it, that, that's the problem with the images, but uh, I mean, you know, also, uh, maybe this is also got to do with education, the question of what is the relationship between making models and, and uh, drawing by hand and, and, and digital drafting, etc. Et 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 again, that's a piano. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not kind of uh, disaffected with Benzo Piano because of the crystal shard and a few other things. But actually, uh, he, 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 won, he has told me a different time of interesting things. Like, for example, he says that in the, in the shop in Genoa, all the projects have to pass constantly through three different forms of representation. Models, hand drawing, digital. And then keep it aside, you know, every scale of model, hand drawing, digital. So I think part of it has got to do with this representation of two-dimensional and also even full-size uh, you know, detailing of parts. And uh, um, then I think you know, it's a question also of going to see work and, and experiencing what 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 is it, you know, what is it that Experiencing the work in terms of one's own body being, you know, I mean, this is, you know, you have to go and see work, you, know, you can't, uh, I mean, you can't just work with images, photographs, I mean, 
I mean, I know, we, I know you're right, of course, we are dominated by him, but... Um, and, and then perhaps another aspect about this funny feeling, that, of course, there's many ways of practicing architecture. I know that, that there's something uh, quixotic about uh, this line I seem to be uh, pushing, but, um, and so uh, there are different ways of practicing architecture. You know, it's not just a fact that that's, that's how it is, you know. But I mean, in terms of uh, trying to develop the develop awareness of, of, of things, of, of space, of, uh, you know, I think you just have to, to, to go and see the work. I mean, I, I, I did have one other thing to say about that. I, I, in, in the beginning, uh, you know, of course, in Columbia, which I haven't been for a while, on Tectonic, I was using my book, studying the Tectonic culture, I, I, I gave students an option that they could make in, in teams models. And, uh, um, but there was a certain, uh, certain thing that happened. They had to make a drawing of a sectional cut for the building. I mean, I gave them the building, but, uh, they had to make a second cut of the building in such a way as to be a didactic model that was still, you know, precise in, in that in that sense realistic in terms of its dimensions and all that. But but was designed, the, the model was designed to express the 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 tectonic idea of the building. And I got two great models out of students, you know, doing that actually. And the sad thing is that the university hasn't no, it's a feeling there. And then they, I think it's a lot. But um, I think that business of making the, the, the models, you know, with that aim, was very productive for them. And, and, and uh, another thing is, I would do deals with students that, because I know that studying architecture in Columbia is a gorilla course, I've never survived it. You know, you know, you have to run the whole time. And, I, I did deal with say, okay, you know, you could, if you show me the partly finished model at the end of the semester, I will give you the grade in any case, and then you will finish the model and go yeah, after. And of course, I lost out sometimes, you know, it But I didn't care, you know, because uh, I got it, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Um. <laughs> Well, one question here. Thank sure. you. Sure. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, or pick up on a, a, a kind of a subject matter that you broached on uh, tall buildings in new cities, tall buildings in old cities, um, and just reflect on something that happened in Toronto in, I think, the early 70s, and I might have some of my facts wrong, but there was a moratorium in Toronto on buildings that, uh, above 12 stories in height, and it was all brought about by the mayor, John Sewell, and uh, a planner by the name of Jane Jacobs who came from New York City oh, yes, to live in Toronto. And there was this kind of uh, synergy of thought about what are we doing with our downtown cores? We borrowed some ideas from, uh, you know, some of the Mies van der Rohe and the Seagram building in New York, and we decided we'd put two of those up in Toronto. And so the thing was getting quite out of control without and height limitations were being broached on in, in, in every capacity. Yeah. And uh, then there was really a kind of a, a, a thought about what is it to live in a city and what is it to, to you know, relate to the street, yeah. relate to the marketplace and this kind of association of uh, buildings in the metropolis. And it was probably one of the most interesting times in Toronto. I mean, we've completely screwed it now because we're in the pocket of developers and the, right. the corporate oil money. But that was an interesting time in Toronto. I'm just kind of wondering, there was political will then. Yeah. <laughs> Would we ever find this again? Like, and, and what does it take? Does it take, what type of people does it get, take to uh, come into politics to kind of make these uh, pronouncements and, and get people to think, you know, about our city? Yeah. But, well, I use that to make the corner even more. I love the way the corner goes. Uh, think in the moment 
needs to think and cannot think. And, and you know, when, you, when you reflect on this, like for example, if you say, well, you know, it's necessary to build high, to build high, to build high, to or we need accommodation of that. I mean, I, I, there's a beautiful project to look on this year from 1937, which is just a main form of just something much more than a sketch. But it, it shows uh, four high rises, you know, that are, I think, uh, yeah, I think they're good, kind of, I think they're good for plans. And uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, sketch that shows on larger and, uh, and uh, graphic tile and sketch and so on. So, and then there are these four high rises that all come to the same height, you know. And uh, I, that is, you know, the, the tragic failure of power to uh, make a decision, you know, and, and, and in a way, you know, the, the way cities are managed, that's a tragic thing. They manage like the, the stock market, the stock exchange, you know, but the, the game which is played with developments of the, you know, this one will get uh, something and build a little higher than the other one, you know, uh, through corrupt operations and all sorts of uh, games. And, and so, you know, to have a plan, to have actually a, 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 to, to make any sense of city planning, I mean, it's such a when someone had a few John Lever said, well, other designers are not going to be possible. You know, very historic, it's not possible anymore. Maybe he's right, you know. But you know, you could see, you know, we switch each other and carry and that would be the line. But I mean it is it is kind of tragic, you know, that the power seems not able to even do that in a in a kind of really bold way. You know, okay, good how is good. But why don't you group them together and they all come to the same height? What's the problem? You know, what is the problem? No, it, it, it has to do with some idea that the city is really like a stock market. You know, you're uh, like a casino. I, I think this is a, no one would admit that, but I, mean, I think it's what really, what is going on, you know. There's no, there's no city architect in Manhattan, there's never been, of course, the developer has always uh, developed the rules, you know, like it's saying. But, it, but, it, but you, when you think about it, it could not be otherwise. I mean, um, great story. I mean, if you think about Paris, you know, except for the screw up in the towers, probably that's how it was, that's also called the corruption. I mean, the, the concentration of the high rise is not very nice in many of them. Not all kinds of the same way, but to concentrate in the other ones and in the front same and nowhere else. Somehow they were able to have the political will to do that. But mostly, it's a free for all. All the, you know, agenda has got an effect, you could say. There's a question on the left here. Kenneth. <coughs> yeah. Um. I was just um, wondering, due to all the perplexity in the 20th century between critics um, about the idea of a utopian city, do you believe it was a successful attempt or an unsuccessful attempt? I'm sorry, I don't quite understand. Okay. Due to all the perplexity in the 20th century, late 19th century, about the utopian city, do you believe it was a successful at, uh, attempt or or an unsuccessful attempt. Utopian city. Utopian city. Yeah. Yeah. Utopian city. Utopian. Yes. Uh, well, what what utopian city did we finally realize? Uh, but it brings up the question in a way slightly relates to the other question. I think that okay, even if one says okay, it wasn't utopian. But, you know, there, there have been moments when it has been possible for an idea and for uh, power and money to, to build a piece of the city in a coherent way, you know. I mean, in, in the Weimar Republic, in Germany, in Frankfurt, and also in Berlin, you know, there were a lot of housing schemes 
that were very conspiracy built. And though they were um, kind of severe, they, they were all, they were built in relation to the landscape and the uh, planting and so on. And they, those things, housing schemes today uh, are very, uh, are very they're kind of beautiful. They, they have survived and they are, and all this vegetation has grown up there. I mean, Berlin has some amazing uh, housing schemes for them. So there was, you know, at that moment it was possible for a planning authority and for, you know, finance and so on to build and build with large, in quite large chunks, you know. And then you, you do see some strange things like this. I've never understood quite why, but Vancouver, at a certain point, and I don't know why I still don't know why, uh, um, develops a typology of, of glass sided towers. That rise to about 14 floors, maybe something like that, 14 or 15 floors. And then there's a whole, you know, they, they, they build a whole uh, swath of them, you know, which gives the city a certain character, I think, you know, a particular area. It's just a whole bit of a mystery. Why does it happen? Something has happened, and, and, and otherwise. So, I, you know, apart from the question of the utopian city, I think that there have been moments when people have been able to. People, I mean, cities and societies have been able to build a substantial amount of fabric in a coherent way. And of course, before, well, that's an interesting thing, you know, I, uh, in a way, uh, I mean, one of the things that's proved to be very difficult is that I, I was once driving to a Swiss valley with a friend of mine, and we were talking about, you know, sort of ugly buildings that are coming out of the place. And then you remark, and I'm sure it's correct. That you know, before, let's say before, uh, I don't know, 1920 or before, yes, maybe you push it closer, like before 1939, you know, there was very limited building materials. And, and so, you know, it was a certain kind of unity because of some kind of typology of vernacular. I mean, that's the only way you could build a place. So it gave a kind of unity to. But once you start to all the different materials, you know, the building begins to look like God and not, you know, because it's constantly highly material here, highly material there. And once you become, when you begin to ad hoc vary the height, uh, everything starts to look like, yes, freestanding. I mean, you could say, I mean, you could be pleasing my argument about freestanding and setting objects. I mean, the, the last thing we need is to proliferate more aesthetic, uh, more freestanding objects that are, have nothing to do with each other, as in the life of the world. I mean, it's dozens of things. Another couple of questions. Um, so, uh, sorry, I understand that you criticize the um, um, the contextual um, problem of a skyscraper, and I was just wondering what you think about the environmentalist um, environmental argument for the skyscraper in terms of its value um, for um, densification. Um, the, basically, the environmental role of skyscraper. They do. They like the skyscraper. Well, I mean, I think, you know, this whole question of sustainability, right, this whole line, is, is, not, is not mature enough if it isn't also um, cultural sustainability. It doesn't have a cultural dimension. It's just simply a technical thing. It's already you know, one more technical fix. I don't think one can just, yeah, I don't think I'm not convinced that that's the Okay, um, last, last question. I do have a quick question about the remark you gave about perspective drawings and how they um, flatten the experience and how they distance the different senses like smell and taste and the, the other senses. Uh, how do you suggest you illustrate these when you're designing? Yeah. Well, anyway, you know, I mean, the question about perspective has to do with, the, you know, the Renaissance, uh, the, the extremely visual, uh, you know, the perspective was kind of a 
the distance in, in terms of its rationalized sight, visual. But um, anyway, if you want to, you know, to, 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 to represent the object, you have to use different media in, in order to through different media represent it. You know? I mean, if, if one uh, thinks, uh, has a book which just has photographs of buildings but no drawings, you know, then, you know, you, you, in a way, it's, it's, you know, it's not adequate representation. So I, I think uh, also in one's own work, one should mix them. Uh, you know, all right, perspective. It's not that you, I, I think one should never do perspective drawings. I'm just making this argument that the perspective has a tendency to push things away. This, this also applies to uh, reflex cameras, for example, that they tend to push things away. Uh, I mean, when she says something in favor of, let's say, telescopic lenses, which tend to bring things closer, you know, like, um, so in that sense. But in any case, in general, I think, you know, architecture should be represented in, in different media and format. Together, so we we'll get an idea of the building, or we even develops, by the way, the idea of the building through different media, you know, rather than just one. You know, so that you pass from the, the mind passes from one to the other. Um, I'd like just to, to make one or two comments and really thank Professor Frampton for giving us this talk this evening. Um, I know he won't like it, but I think we have heard the beginnings of an extremely interesting, um, a rather interesting autobiography in terms of an intellectual biography. He started it here. I, I have no idea whether he's going on because he told us things w that were very interesting in relation to the to the time and the way his ideas were working. The only other person that I have. Um, the, well, there, there are probably other books like that, but if you read Karl Popper's book, An Un Unending Quest, Karl Popper goes through his years and tries to chart the way his ideas were changed over encounters or books or um, gifts given, and it's an extremely interesting, um, interesting volume. And I think we've had the, the hints of that, and I, I would like to thank Kenneth Frampton very much for that. Um, he reminds me very much, as I said at, at the beginning, and we've had that, we've got the 20th century brought right up to date in the 21st, but any of you have ever heard The Goon Show? Probably only, only Kenneth and I know The Goon Show. Well, <laughs> this, this slight laughter of Kenneth's is Vintage Goon Show. And he knows what I'm talking about. Please Google The Goon Show, and you will understand this sudden, wonderful abandon of, of laughter, and then you go on to another subject. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kenneth Frampton.